أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسألونك they ask you meaning the Sahaba they ask you O Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the Sahaba the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم they only asked him those questions that were relevant and those questions that were beneficial for their dunya as well as their akhirah so يسألونك they ask you ماذا أحل لهم then what is halal for them earlier we were told that بهيمت الأنعام are all lawful for you but that's only about animals and then the exceptions are mentioned that this is not halal for you so now they ask okay so what is really halal for us what are we allowed to eat قل say أحل لكم الطيبات permissible for you are all good things الطيبات is a plural of طيبة meaning all pure clean good things are lawful for you الطيبات what does it refer to we have studied about طيب food طيبات early in Surah Al-Baqarah in great detail what does it refer to food that is halal first of all we learn in Surah Al-A'raf ayah 157 وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِسِ The Prophet ﷺ, he made lawful for them the good things. So what are the good things? Those things that are lawful. So every halal food is tayyib. Okay? And every haram food is khabis. It is impure. So أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ So tayyibat includes fruits, vegetables, grains, even the meat, that is halal, poultry, as long as it meets the requirements of halal. So, أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَمَا عَلَّمْتُمْ And that which you taught. مَا عَلَّمْتُمْ What this means is, وَصَيْدُ مَا عَلَّمْتُمْ Meaning, and the game, the hunt of that which you have taught. Meaning, the hunt of the animal which you have trained. The hunt of the animal that you have trained. So for example, a person has a dog and he has trained it as a hunting dog. So if he takes that dog with him for hunting and the dog catches, let's say, a particular animal, then that animal is halal. Obviously, as long as that animal is Halal fi ذاته right? It is halal in itself Not that if the dog catches a pig You're going to eat it Because Allah says وَمَا عَلَّمْتُمْ No It's understood وَصَيْدُ مَا عَلَّمْتُمْ مِنَ الجوارح The hunting animals The word jawarih What does it mean? Limbs Isn't that the meaning of jawarih? Limbs We say the qalb, the lisan, the jawarih. The word jawarih is a plural of jariha. Jariha. With the time of at the end. And jariha is from the root letters jim raha. And jariha has been understood in two ways. First of all, it is derived from the word jarh. And jarh is to acquire, to earn something. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ and he knows what you acquire during the day. What you earn during the day. So what does jaraha mean? To acquire. And from this is jawarih, which is used for limbs. Why? Because through your limbs, you acquire, you get many things. You get from one place to the other. You do different things. You eat. You sit. I mean, with your limbs, you do many, many things. Your limbs are... Jawarih are a means of acquiring deeds, actions. Secondly, they said that the word jawarih is derived from the word jurh. And what does jurh mean? Wound. Wal juruha qisas. And for all wounds, all injuries also there is qisas. So what does jurh mean? Wound. So who is a jariha? Who are jawarih? Those which give wounds to the other. That which attacks the other. So what does it mean? Hunting animals. 
So wama alam tu min al jawarihi and the hunt of that which you have taught. And who who is it who who you have taught the jawarih, meaning the hunting animals. And why are they called jawarih? Because they bring the hunt for you. Like sometimes you will notice how hunting dogs they will chase an animal till far distance even, and they will go from between trees and over a stream, and you can't follow. So why are they called jawarih? Because they bring the catch for you. They bring the catch for you. And they're also called jawarih because they don't kill the catch, but rather they just give a wound to the catch. You understand? They just endear the catch. So that that animal that has been caught, it doesn't run away. So, وَمَا عَلَّمْتُ مِنَ الْجَوَارِحِ Meaning the hunt of those hunting animals whom you have taught. And remember that these hunting animals, it doesn't just refer to dogs, but it applies to birds even. It applies to animals, meaning hounds, whether it is a dog or a wild cat or whatever. And it also applies to hunting birds like falcons. Mukallibin, meaning as trainers, whom you have taught as trainers. The word mukallibin is a plural of mukallib. And mukallib is from the root letters kaf lamba. What does kalb mean? Dog. This is not qalb. What is qalb? Heart. And what is kalb? Dog. So make sure you pronounce qalb properly. Because you might be referring to someone's or your own qalb and you might say kalb. So you have to be careful. So kalb is dog. Now mukallib first of all means one who trains an animal. One who trains, instructs, teaches an animal. For what? To be a good pet in the house? No, for hunting. So who is mukallib? An animal trainer. For what? For hunting purposes, specifically. Whether he is training birds or he is training animals. And remember that this trainer, sometimes these trainers are human beings and other times trainers are also other animals. Okay? Like for example, if you want to train a dog, you will train it. I mean, the person will train it himself, but he will also use other dogs to train the animal. So mukallib can be the person and can also apply to another animal that is used for training. Secondly, mukallib is one who sends a kalb, one who releases, one who sends a kalb. Like for example, it is said, kalabtu al-kalb, meaning I released the hound on the prey. I sent the dog, kalabtu al-kalb, I sent the dog, why? To go and catch the hunt. So what does it mean by mukallibin? Meaning the game caught by what you have trained of hunting animals. The game caught by what? The jawarih. And these jawarih, you are their mukallibin. You have trained them. It's not just any hunting animal, but rather you have trained it yourself. It's not just any wild animal, but you have trained it yourself. You are mukallib of that jawarih. You understand? You are trainer. Secondly, what does it mean by mukallibin? Meaning ones whom you have released, ones whom you have sent, ones whom you have dispatched against who? Against the prey. So for example, you spot a catch a game animal and you have your dogs with you. So you send your dogs. Now when your dogs go and catch that game, that game is lawful for you. So what does Mukallibin refer to to summarize? First of all, you as a trainer. And secondly, you as the dispatcher, the sender of the hunting animal. Tu'allimunahunna, you teach them. Meaning you have taught the jawarih. You have trained the jawarih. Mimma allah from that which Allah has taught you. Meaning, the animal that is being used for hunting must be a trained animal. 
It must be a trained animal. You have taught it. You have trained it. Now what is the sign of a trained animal? Of a trained hunting hound? First of all, that when a person sends that hunting animal, he comes back. Okay, It's not like you send the dog and the dog never comes back. It just goes and catches whatever he has caught and he starts eating it himself and you can't find the dog anywhere. No. What's the sign, first of all, that when you send it, it comes back. When you call, it responds. The second sign is that it can be restrained when reprimanded, when scolded. So for example, if you tell the dog, sit, stop, come back, the dog understands. He responds. He can be curbed. He can be restrained when he is reprimanded. And thirdly, that the animal, it seizes, it holds on to the catch, the game, without eating of it. Meaning when he catches the game, he doesn't eat it. He only holds it. And these three tests, the animal must have passed at least three times. You must have tested the animal for these three tests at least three times. If he passes all three times, then he has the license of a hunting dog. And if he hasn't passed, then what does it mean? He needs to take the test again. He needs some more training. So, تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهُ Meaning, how do you train these dogs? How do you train these animals? From the knowledge that Allah has given you. And this is a huge blessing of Allah. That you are actually able to train these wild animals for your work. فَكُلُوا So eat. مِمَّا From that which أَمْسَكْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ They hold on to upon you. Amsakna is from the root letters Mim Sin Kaf. What does Imsak mean? To hold on to something. To retain something. So eat of that which they hold for you. Meaning eat of the prey, the game, the catch that your hunting animals are holding for you. What does it mean? That if the hunting animal started eating from that prey, that's not lawful for you. It's lawful for you only when he is holding it. He's not eating of it. Even if your hunting animal manages to kill the catch. Like for example, there is a small deer. And your three dogs, they manage to catch the deer. Now, the three dogs are holding on to the deer. Now one is that the deer is moving, it's wrestling, it's trying to get away, but it cannot. They're holding the deer for you. You come there, you slaughter the deer, it's lawful for you. Now the other is that when they caught it, they're not eating it, but the deer dies. The deer dies. It's been killed. So in that case again, it is lawful for you. Why? Because they're holding the deer for you even if the deer is dead because of them. The third case is where they catch the deer, they kill the deer, and they start eating it. Is that lawful for you? No, it's not lawful for you. So, فَكُلُوا مِمَّا أَمْسَكْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ And this is in contrast to the untrained hunting creatures whose catch is not lawful for consumption. And one has to do its the cat, as we learned earlier. إِلَّا مَا ذَكَّيْتُمْ وَذْكُرُوا And you mention اسم الله عليه The name of Allah upon it. What does it mean by this? Mention the name of Allah upon it. This has been understood in two ways. And both of them are important and necessary. That first of all, when you release your hunting animal to catch the game, to catch the prey, at that time, you know, as مُكَلِّبِينَ What does مُكَلِّبِينَ mean? Kalabdul kalba, I sent the kalb. So when you send the dog, what should you say? Bismillah. And secondly, what this means is that the alayhi, that even when you're eating the animal, because it says over here, fakulu mimma amsakna alaykum, then at that time also, what should you say? Bismillah. Pronounce the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shows to us that 
if a person is trying to hunt an animal with either a hunting animal or he is using an arrow or a gun or something like that, then when he is releasing the arrow or when he is shooting, at that time also what should he say? Bismillah. What does this show? That it's not important to slaughter the animal with your hand. So what does this show? That even when machine slaughter, when you press the button, okay, what are you supposed to say? Bismillah. Because you're using a tool to get to the animal. Because you can't reach the animal yourself. It's impossible for you to slaughter all these animals at the same time. It's not humanly possible. Similarly, if there's a deer one mile from you, across the mountain, can you catch it? Can you reach it with your knife and then slaughter it? You can't. There's a rule in fiqh, there's a principle in fiqh that al-mushaqqatu tajlibu taysir. That difficulty, it brings ease. When you're in a difficult situation, then the commands are easy. Which is why, in the absence of water, what is permissible? Tayammum. Similarly, when the animal is far away from you, then what is permissible? That you shoot your arrow. And what's the rule again? That whether it is that you're sending your arrow, or the bullet, or your hunting animal, or your knife, what is the rule? You have to say Bismillah. So, وَذْكُرُوا إِسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ And fear Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ Indeed, Allah is swift in taking the account. Look at the way that the ayah ends. Allah is swift. He is very quick. He is very fast in taking hisab. So be careful about what you say. Be careful about what you eat, about how you hunt. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn about the hirs, the love or the, you can say the greed, the desire that the sahaba had for knowledge. That the sahaba had for correct knowledge. Knowledge about halal and haram. That although it was mentioned that this is lawful for you and this is haram for you, yet they asked what is halal for us. It shows how much desire they had to know about what is right and what is wrong. What do we think? Oh, it's so complicated, I can't bother. But the sahaba, they asked. As we learned earlier that Umar radhi anhu, he asked the Prophet sallallahu about the kalala so much so, that the Prophet ﷺ tapped, he poked him in his chest. And he said, this ayah should be enough now. That's it, khalas, no more questions. Secondly, we learn from this ayah that the matter of making something halal and the matter of making something haram belongs exclusively to who? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the evidence for that? يَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَا أُحِلَّ لَهُمْ what does Allah say? قُلْ أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ Now if you look at it, they asked who? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who gave the answer? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it is said that this right belongs exclusively to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It doesn't even belong to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also did not have the authority to make anything halal by himself or make something haram by himself. Which is why when he made something haram on himself, he was reprimanded. That, Ya ayyuhan nabi, lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Why do you make unlawful what Allah has made lawful for you? And whatever the Prophet ﷺ instructed us with regards to halal and haram, that also came from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why we have to be extremely careful about what we call halal, what we call haram. Because sometimes, very casually we say, oh this is halal, oh that is haram. Like for example, with regards to the machine slaughter, many times, personally even I used to think up until yesterday that it's completely haram. But when I learned that, illa ma dhakkaytum, it falls under that. And when you learn, then you realize the other side as well. You have to look at evidences from both sides. And when you learn more, then you realize more. So we have to be very careful about passing judgments. 
If you disagree, it's your right to disagree. Go ahead. Don't eat that. But don't say that is haram and this is halal. Because this right belongs exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exclusively to Him. We don't have the right to say this is halal, this is haram. Unless obviously, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned something to be halal or haram. We also learn from this ayah that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal for us is beneficial for us. Why? Because Allah says He has made lawful for you what? Tayyibat. What is tayyib? Good, clean, wholesome, healthy, nutritious, beneficial. So everything that Allah has made lawful for us, what is it? It is beneficial for us. It is nafir. It is beneficial for our bodies, for everybody. And on the contrary, whatever Allah has made haram is actually harmful for us. We also learn from this ayah about the allowance of eating that which the hunting animal has caught. The permission of eating that which the hunting animal has caught. As long as the hunting animal is first of all trained, that's what we learned. مِمَّا عَلَّمْتُمْ مُكَلِّبِينَ the animal must be a trained animal. And secondly, all of the conditions must be met. What are the conditions? That you must have said Bismillah. And that the animal, it should not have eaten anything of it. So, the conditions of a hunting animal being lawful are, first of all, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is mentioned at the time of sending the hunting animal. What's the evidence for that? As it is mentioned in the ayah, وَذْكُرُوا إِسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ and elsewhere in the Quran as well, in Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 121, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّهُ لَفِسْقِ And do not eat of that upon which the name of Allah has not been mentioned. Do not eat of that upon which the name of Allah has not been mentioned. So this is very clear. If Allah's name has not been mentioned, you're not allowed to eat of it. Whether a Christian gives it to you or a Jew gives it to you or a Muslim gives it to you. Because Allah says very clearly, لا تأكلوا مما لم يذكر اسم الله عليه. So first of all, what's the condition? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name must be mentioned at the time of sending the hunting animal or shooting the arrow or whatever. Secondly, the animal must not eat of the prey. And if he eats from it, it is not lawful for you. Because it means that he hunted it for himself, not for you. Or it means that that animal is not still trained. Because it forgot. Or it doesn't care about what the animal has been taught. So, basically, the animal should not eat of the prey. The Prophet ﷺ said, If the dog eats from the game, then do not eat from it. For I fear that it has caught it, as prey for itself. And this is mercy, kindness towards animals. That if he has hunted it for himself, don't eat it. He wants it for himself. That was his niya. This shows the importance of intention, even with animals. The third condition is that the dog or the hunting animal must have wounded the animal. He must have wounded the animal. How? either with his claws or with his teeth or whatever. If he slammed the animal against something and then caught it, like for example, he just picked up or three dogs together, there's a very tiny deer, they hit it. So what happens? That deer goes flying, it hits the rock and it falls to the ground. You may have seen that some animals actually do that. Like for example, cats sometimes when they catch a mouse or something, they will not kill it immediately, but they will hit it against the wall or something until eventually the mouse will die. So animals sometimes do that. So if that hunting animal hits the animal on something, and as a result that animal dies, that is not lawful. Because the animal died because of what? Because of the blow. And not because of the hunting animal. I mean, the hunting animal did not kill it itself. Similarly, if, let's say, the dogs are chasing the deer and the deer falls in the water, 
it drowns and it dies. Again, that deer is not lawful. It must have wounded, it must have injured the animal itself. Because of this, it is also said that whatever you're using, let's say if you're using a tool, like an arrow, it must be something that tears through the skin. Because the dog as well, when he will catch the deer or something, what will he do? He will bite it. As a result, what's going to happen? He's going to tear through the skin. Some blood is going to flow out. Whatever little it is, it is going to flow out. Similarly, if you're using another tool, it must tear through the skin. And if it's not tearing through the skin, then again, that animal will not be halal for you. Because let's say if you're using rubber bullets or something like that, because of the blow, it has died. Not because it has been cut through. So there has to be a cut. There has to be a mark on that animal. Fourthly, no other animal must have joined the hunt. Let's say you send your dog and there is a wolf. There is a pack of wolves and they join. So in that case, you are not going to take that deer. Why? Because you don't know who actually killed the deer. Whether it was your dog or it was some other untrained animal. You said Bismillah when you released your dog. But the other wolves that came, nobody said Bismillah on them. Ardi ibn Hatim said that I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, I send hunting dogs and mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. He replied, If with mentioning Allah's name you let loose your tamed dog after a game and it catches it, you may eat what it catches. I said, even if it kills the game? He replied, even if it kills the game. Unless another dog joins the hunt. For you mentioned Allah's name when you send your dog, but not the other dog. So this again shows the importance of pronouncing Bismillah. The Prophet ﷺ also said that if you find another dog with your dog and the game animal has been killed, do not eat it. Let's say you sent your dog. Now, You couldn't find your dog. Eventually you found it. And you see that the prey is dead. And there's your dog and there's another dog. You don't know who killed it. There are no cameras over there. And the dog's not going to tell you. I did it. So in that case, don't eat it. For verily, you don't know which of them killed it. Now, when you send your hunting animal, there's two possibilities. Either he will catch the prey and he will just hold it so that the prey is not dead it is still alive or he will catch the prey and kill the prey two possibilities and third is that he will start eating if he starts eating obviously not halal for you but in the first two cases it is halal for you now what are you supposed to do with the animal the first case in which you find the game animal alive Let's say your dogs are only holding on to the deer. The deer is still alive. What are you supposed to do? You have to slaughter it. It is not permissible to eat it without properly slaughtering it. The Prophet ﷺ said, And what you have hunted with your untrained dog, and you are able to kill it, then eat it. So basically, if you find the game animal alive, then what do you do? Slaughter it. Secondly, if the animal is caught after it has died, okay, let's say your dogs are holding on to it and the deer is dead, it is still permissible to eat it as long as Bismillah was pronounced when shooting the arrow or when sending the hunting animal. And uh, the tool or the arrow that you use to kill that animal with was what? it was sharp enough to tear through the skin. And your hunting dog as well, when it caught and killed the animal, there has to be some mark of the bite. Basically, the main thing is that the skin of the game animal must be torn through. Either by your hunting animal or your arrow or your bullet or whatever that you have used. It must be torn through if it's dead already. If it's not torn through, then it's not halal for you. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, if it is struck by the blunt part, thus killing the animal, then do not eat it. For verily it is that which has been struck. So basically, to summarize, the game that is caught by hunting is permissible as long as certain conditions are met. What are those conditions? Bismillah. The animal must be trained. The animal must have caught it by itself. It must not eat of it. And if you're using a tool, if you're using a weapon, it should have cut through the skin. And if you find the game alive, then you have to slaughter it. If you find it dead, then you have to see some mark on the skin of the animal that must have torn through the skin. Whether it is the teeth of your hunting dog, or it is the blade, or whatever it is. So let's say that the needle is used to make the animal unconscious. So when you find it, you slaughter it. Okay, because it's still unconscious. It's not dead yet. But let's say you found it the next day. You found it the next day. It tore through the skin. And it was your act that killed the animal. And it was not killed by a blow. But rather something went in its body. It tore through the body. And because of that, it died. You understand? Because the needle has gone through the skin. I know this is something very strange for us because first of all, we're not into this stuff. Although there are people who still hunt. I'm sure many may know some people who hunt. So these rules are very important for us to know. And the hunted animal, the game is not a normal maita. Remember that. It's a different type of maita. You have caused its death. You said bismillah. This is different. We also learn from this ayah about the prohibition of eating any meat on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name has not been mentioned. Remember that saying the name of Allah is a condition of meat being halal. Because Allah says over here, وَذْكُرُ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ And in Surah Al-An'am, as I mentioned to you, the ayah which mentions that وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّهُ لَفِسْقَ it has been said that saying the name of Allah is a condition of meat being halal and it is not excused by forgetting. It is not excused by forgetting or not knowing according to the most scholarly opinion. And this is the opinion of Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ibn Taymiyyah as well as recently Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. All of them have said that you have to say Bismillah when slaughtering the animal if a person forgets not halal. Why? Because Allah says explicitly, لا تأكلوا مما لم يذكر اسم الله عليه. Don't eat of it on which Allah's name has not been mentioned. So if a person forgets, let's say he shot the arrow. Oh my God, I didn't say Bismillah. And the game got killed. Is that going to be lawful for you? No. The Prophet ﷺ said, if the blood flows and the name of Allah is mentioned, then eat. Okay? Then eat. We also learn about the virtue of knowledge from this ayah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has differentiated between the hunt of the animal that has training and the hunt of the animal that does not have training. Can you imagine? Ilm makes a difference even in animals. So how much of a difference should it make between humans? How much of a difference could it make? A huge difference. Great difference. Between someone who knows and someone who doesn't know. The hunt of the animal that is trained is halal. And the hunt of the animal that is not trained, that does not have ilm is haram. It's not lawful for you. Look at the difference that ill makes. One becomes halal and the other becomes haram. So what does it show? The virtue, the excellence, the fadila of ill. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those people who know and those people who don't know, can they be the same? They cannot be the same. We also learn from this ayah, about the barakah, the blessing of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you mention the name of Allah, then the food becomes halal. And if you don't mention the name of Allah, food does not become halal. 
This is the barakah, this is the blessing of mentioning the name of Allah. We also learn from this ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cuts off any chances or any possibilities of a person being uh, impressed by himself or admiring himself. Because over here it has been said, تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ Allah. That you teach, you train these animals from which knowledge? From the knowledge that Allah gave you. So just because you managed to train a dog, don't be too proud of yourself. You know, sometimes if people are successful in teaching even a child something, like how to say salam, or how to say a particular word, they take so much pride in it. I taught him how to say that. I taught her how to say that. They take so much pride in it. Similarly, if a person manages to train an animal, like a bird, to say something, or to do something, people take so much pride in that. What does Allah say? Don't be too proud. Allah is the one who gave you that knowledge. So, a person can never be proud of their ilm that he learns and their ilm that he teaches. Of course, you should be happy. Of course, it's a big achievement. You manage to teach a child how to say Allah's name. It's a big achievement. You should be happy. But the point that I'm making is that you shouldn't be proud. That, look, I taught him. I taught her. We also learn from this ayah that ilm, knowledge, is not just about ulum shari, about uh, the sciences of the religion only. Knowledge is not limited to religion only. Because over here, what is ilm referring to? Dog training. Animal training. So basically, ilm applies to any knowledge, any science that is relevant and beneficial to people. Relevant and beneficial to people. Because when you're training a dog, it's definitely relevant to people. And it's definitely beneficial for people as well. We also learn from this ayah about the vastness of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He has permitted us for to eat what we uh, slaughter ourselves and also what our animals catch for us. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The vastness of His mercy. That imagine if the only animal that was halal was the one that you slaughter properly yourself and not what you hunt. It would be difficult. For us, it doesn't create much difficulty, but for people who are living in such areas in which they have to hunt, for them, this is a necessity. This is something that is very major, very important. So, this shows the vastness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also learn from this ayah that whatever a person hunts, whatever a person catches, whatever a person slaughters, he will be questioned about it. Many times we go and buy meat, we cook it, and we throw it. We don't eat it. Don't we do that? Or we go and buy meat, and we only get, let's say, the meat part, and we leave the bones or we leave other parts of the animal that could be very beneficial. Like, for example, the bones, okay, you're not going to chew on them, but you could make good stock out of them. You could use them to make different things. But sometimes what do we do? We're so negligent, we're so wasteful when it comes to meat. I mean, an animal has been slaughtered and you're just eating a few parts and you're wasting the rest of it or you cook a lot of it and you eat a few pieces and you waste the rest of it. This is what? Wasted. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah has sariyul hisab. Allah is swift in taking the account. Also if you see, sometimes when people are hunting, Sometimes they hunt only for sport. Isn't it so? They hunt only for sport. Only for fun. As entertainment, not for food. But what does Allah say over here? Inna Allah has sariyul hisab. Allah is swift in taking the account. That how much you hunted, how much you bought, how much you ate, how much you wasted, how much you killed for no reason. Allah is going to question you about that. So this meat that Allah has made permissible for you, use it carefully. Don't waste it. Use it carefully. Don't be wasteful about it. And don't kill animals excessively, treating them harshly, raising them up in a very harsh manner, killing them brutally. All of this is what? Something that is forbidden. Allah is sadir. 
in taking the account. Let's listen to the recitation. Yeah. 